Okay. So good evening, everybody. We have come to our final uh, session for these past two days, and uh, it's called Twilight. Uh, I must say that um, uh, Dr. Janine Fobel, um unfortunately, will not be able to join us. So that means that um, uh, Danny and Martin, you have, uh, uh, you can take extra time if you need. Oh, um, that's great. <laughs> okay, I won't hassle you. Um, so our first uh, speaker for uh, the final session is uh, Dr. Martin Lack. Uh, uh, Dr. Martin Lack uh, obtained his PhD on a thesis on the post, uh, post-war Dutch German, German economic and political relations. He specializes in Dutch German relations, modern German history, military history, and the Second World War. And at the moment, he does research into the fate of Dutch Jewish orphans in the post-1945 period, as well as being a lecturer of political history at Radboud University Nijmegen. He is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Slavic Military Studies. And today, uh, and of course, uh, um, from the University of Amsterdam, today, uh, Dr. Lack will talk about No Trees is Left Standing, the Battle for Overloon, September till October 1944. Please, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yaron, for uh, introducing me with those uh, kind words. Uh, let me see if I can indeed uh, share my, uh, my screen. Um, it works. Okay. They, so can, can everyone see this? Yes. yes. Okay, very good. So it's also nice to see uh, Boaz and Daniela. It's been only a month since we saw you. So each other last time. Um, great that I have some extra time, although I will probably give most of my extra time to, to Dan, uh, because I don't want to tie you that much with all these uh, military uh, details, perhaps. So um, thank you once more for having me. Um, my topic is a bit um, off topic uh, with respect to the Martin Gilbert uh, lecture, uh, lectures topic of the last two days, but still I'm happy to, to share my thoughts uh, with you, and this is indeed a presentation on the Battle of Overloan, as we call it in uh, the Netherlands, but Jaron, I think you did a very good job in pronouncing it uh, in English, but I will stick to the Dutch, which is Overloan. Um, and the title, No Tree is Left Standing, is uh, taken from a, uh, from a journal uh, or a diary of, uh, of an inhabitant of Overloan who returned after the fight in, in uh, early 1945. Uh, when he noticed that there was basically no tree left standing after the battle. And I will explain to you how that happened. Um, this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So first, I'm going to give you some background or context as to explain why this battle took place in the first. Uh, Maybe in the first enlarge year. your PowerPoint. You can uh, make it this, a full screen. Is that better, boss? Yeah, is that okay? Okay. Great. Good. Right, so I first will provide you some background and some context to understand where this uh, Battle of Overloan uh, came from or what, what, what were its origins. Um, I will try to explain to you why this is often referred to as a forgotten battle, because I, I imagine that very few of you immediately have a, a sort of a light going on when uh, the word Overloan is mentioned. Um, the Netherlands, I think, will work, but Overloan is not a, a town that is familiar to an, an international audience. I'll tell you something about the forces involved in the course of the battle. Um, and I want to say something uh, finally about how we can position this battle uh, around Overloan in the wider uh, context of the Western European theater. So was this really a tank battle on Dutch soil or was it something else? So that is uh, what I'm going to do today. Um, this is uh, one more quote, and this is from a, a British officer who fought at Overloan. Um, and he basically describes it as mud, mines, and woods, stiff with enemy all the way. So that, that basically sort of summarizes um, the type of battle that took place here in this uh, sort of southeastern part of the Netherlands. Right? So it's uh, important to emphasize immediately that this is not a war of movement, which immediately says something about the possible discussion on whether or not this was a tank battle in the first place. So some background. Um, the battle for Overloan is basically a result of the failure of Operation Market Garden, which I assume is familiar to all of you. Uh, they failed airborne landings uh, around uh, Nijmegen and Arnhem, so in the Netherlands, with their initial goal to 
make a rapid, uh, rapid advance through the Netherlands, then turning right uh, in, in direction of the German Ruhr area. But that operation failed, as you all know. The, the British didn't succeed in taking the bridges around Arnhem. Um, on the other hand, you could say, well, the Allies were successful in uh, conquering the bridges at Nijmegen, but this resulted in a huge bulge in the German front, so around 80 kilometers in length and 20 to 30 kilometers wide, stretching just beyond uh, Nijmegen. Nijmegen is um, one of the larger provincial cities in the Netherlands with just over 100,000 inhabitants, just to give you an impression. The German army in that sector, so the predominantly the first Fallschirm army and the 15th army, or the 15th army, was basically cut in half or split in two by this Allied offensive. However, what the Allies failed to do was to dislodge the Germans from two extensive bridges, uh, bridgeheads they had across the river Maas, as we call it in the Netherlands, uh, but Meuse in, the, in English is more familiar. Folk. But there's a problem with these two bridgeheads. And the first is, the most important one is, um, is the bridgehead on the west side of the river. Now you should remember that the Allies did not give up their plans to invade Germany. Of course, they didn't. Uh, but now they were looking for a different route into Germany, and they wanted to do that via uh, that western bridgehead across the Meuse, um, which is called the Bill in the Netherlands. And I will tell you a bit more about what kind of a region that is, also to, to understand why this battle evolved as it did. Uh, but as long as the Germans had that bridgehead there, um, this was a serious threat to a planned uh, Allied advance in Germany. So the plan was now after the failure of Market Garden that the British and the Americans uh, would try to eliminate this bridgehead. They had the forces in the vicinity anyway, and then advance towards Cologne, Dusseldorf. Now this sounds like a very important part of the uh, Allied strategy and a very important part of Allied warfare in the Western theater of war. You can see it on this map. So it is in, uh, in English. Um, here to the right, you can see Nijmegen. And you can see that the, the boat extends just close to Arnhem, but the, the direction of the attack is southeastern, so to the, to the Maas River, as it's called here. So that's the direction the Allies want to advance. And it's, it's a sizable operation. But um, to many historians, and also in military historians, this is not a battle that is very famous. Right? So I probably assume that you all are familiar with fighting around Caen, Bastogne, uh, saint Lô, uh, Bayeux, uh, Cherbourg, that those are all familiar names, Antwerp perhaps. Um, but there are those military historians who said, well, if you, if you look at where the toughest fighting took place, it was perhaps, and I'm not downplaying anything, uh, what the Allies did in Normandy, but perhaps you should look at uh, the fighting in Italy, so Anzio, Monte Cassino, perhaps the, the forests of Jürgenwald in, uh, south, uh, in the south of Germany, and some authors have stated uh, the Pill region where my lecture is about, predominantly. But to many, this, this battle around Overloan is a, an, an obscure battle, right? So if you, if, you, if you check the main military histories of the Second World War in the West, if, if this is mentioned, it's only referred to as a small engagement uh, not really important, um, and it, it's mostly neglected by uh, professional historians. Uh, so, so that means that basically that the information that we do have is um, we need to take that from some excellent studies by amateur historians who write very big books uh, on especially German units in the area. More on that in a few moments. Uh, the most important book here was written by two famous Dutch historians, Quartos Altus and uh, Inet Veld. The latter wrote an extensive work on the, the Dutch SS and how it functioned, um, but the title says it all. So he refers to it as a forgotten battle. And the, the primary reason probably is that this is not a spectacular battle like that at Arnhem. So not no large scale uh, airborne operations, um, not really a battle that looks like what, what we saw in the rest of the Second World War. It, it's more reminiscent of the First World War also, due to the terrible weather, which I will tell you a bit more later. Just to give you a very short overview of, um, of the forces involved, to the right you can see a, a Panther tank, which is essential uh, to understand why the Germans uh, were able to put up such a stiff resistance. Um, for the Allies, it's predominantly the 7th US Armored Division, the 3rd British Infantry Division, and 11th British Armored Division. 
And then we have a hodgepodge of German units, uh, predominantly Kampfgruppe Water, the 7th uh, Parachute Division, and above all, the 107th Panzer Brigade. And the 107th Panzer Brigade had caused a lot of trouble already to the Allies at Arnhem. It cut Hell's Highway twice, um, and it was a very experienced unit. So it, it had uh, gained a lot of combat experience in the East before being transferred to the West in uh, late September 1944. So it was highly experienced, and that is not what the Americans expected uh, to meet opposite of that. Right? So the Americans expect to, to meet um, distracted, demoralized, and poorly trained German units, whereas the, con the opposite was actually true. So the US, the US forces, when they, they design their attack, when they think about it, uh, they totally underestimate the enemy. And they also underestimate one more thing, and that's the terrain, right? And you should imagine that the, the pill area that we are talking about here during the Second World War was one of the most inhospitable, er, inhospitable areas of the Netherlands. Take into account that the paved roads were only constructed there after the Second World War. So as soon as rain came, the whole area turned into to mud, and it was basically a dreary and impenetrable, impenetrable area. Moreover, there were a lot of a lot of woods and the canals, and of course, now it is known for all its water, and the canals in this region go from north to south, essentially making them excellent um, tank obstacles for the Germans to use. And they, they could use this and did this to great effect uh, because the Germans excel, we must admit, um, in defensive warfare. And, and the natural circumstances basically allowed them to do so. Right? So there were a few small rivers in the area as well, but because of the incessant rain, these had swollen to, to mighty water obstacles. Right? So there, there are a number of reasons why the first initial attack by the Americans, this is a Dutch map, I'm sorry, uh, but it basically says battle uh, for overloan, the American attacks from 30th of September to 7th of October by the 7th Armored Division. And you can see that the, there is some advance uh, and but that there's also strong German counterattacks. And the Americans launched their attack on uh, the 30th of, 30th of September, perhaps amidst a typical Dutch weather, if you want. So there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of wind, uh, which basically means that these American attacks come to an immediate standstill. Right? So the Americans want to use their, uh, their air power, but it's foggy, it's cloudy, so they can't. Um, and they cannot go off road, so the few paved roads that are there, they cannot leave it because it would immediately mean that their tanks would be stuck in the mud. So this makes them excellent targets for uh, the, the German tanks and especially artillery units. And the Germans do not limit themselves to, to just defending. They also uh, commit a number of uh, fierce counterattacks. They are not successful, but they tell the Americans this is not a So there's fierce fighting, and Americans describe it as hand grenades and bayonet were the weapons of those days. Right? So it's totally not what the Americans expect. So in the, in the end, because I don't want to go into too much detail, I'm, I'm working on an English translation of the Dutch book here. So when it comes out, you can read it in more detail. They do advance uh, two kilometers, but they do not take overload. You know, by the 7th of October, the Americans basically cancel their attack. And the cost is heavy. They lose oh, 35 tanks, other vehicles, and almost 450 killed, wounded, and missing. Um, and that is one of the highest casualty rates of American units in the Second World War in the Netherlands. So why is this a failure? I also already spoke about terrain, but I also spoke about the underestimation. And uh, we must also admit that the Germans uh, made most use of the circumstance that there. They, were, they put up quite... Uh, a skillful defense. Does that mean that the Germans came off lightly? No, their losses were also heavy, especially in tanks. I showed you that image of uh, this uh, Panther tank. This was left behind and was later restored and put in the museum at Overloan, about which a little bit more later. Right, and then the, the second phase of this uh, battle basically begins, and that is when the British come in and try to take over. So initially they want to, to launch their attack on the 10th of over. They are now familiar with the terrain. They now know that they have strong op uh, opposing forces. So they try to prepare this attack uh, thoroughly, bringing in new reinforcements and above all, a lot of artillery. And in the end, 
due to uh, the fact that the weather is bad, and they need to postpone the attack until the 12th October. And this is what the British call Operation Constellation. Constellation is the part where they attack. Overloan Operation Entry is the broader strategic operation uh, in the direction of Cologne and Dusseldorf. And Entry is, I think it is uh, named after a horse track in London, if I'm correct. So the British take over and they also come to the conclusion, well, this is not the Netherlands that most of us have for it to be. Uh, it was a cry, far cry from the land of tulips and smiling burgers that many have imagined it to be. Uh, but the British basically tried to prevent casualties. Well, how do they do that? Um, they rely on artillery. And on the 12th of October, they launch their attack by uh, a bombardment of over 100,000 shells at Overloan. Right? So they basically blow the whole village to pieces. And they use a, a fire roller or a steam roller for that. So every five minutes, they shift the fire 100 meters further towards Overloan. Um, and despite very heavy casualties, the British take uh, Overloan on the, at the end of 14th of October, right? Does it mean that the battle is over and that the British now have a free pathway into Germany? No, they still have to take Venray and Venlo, which will also cost them dearly. Uh, but the battle for Overloan basically ends on the 14th. Um, this is an image of Overloan uh, when the British advance. It is, it's a familiar picture. Uh, you see two Churchill tanks here uh, passing the Catholic Church here. You see a number of graves still in the background of the British soldier. Um, and this is what was left after the battle. So this is again uh, a German Panzer tank. As you can see, in, the sign in Dutch reads, uh, Axis denied, war museum uh, to the right. So once uh, the Second World War was over, a museum was built on this in this, in this area, it used to be the National War Resistance Museum, and now I think it's the, or it used to be the Liberty Park, and now it's the National War Museum. And if you go to the Netherlands, and if you are close to Overloan, which is really a very small city, so you can bypass it very quickly and easily, uh, I highly recommend this, this museum. This, this panther that you actually see here in the picture has been fully restored uh, and now at this place in the museum. Now then I want to turn to uh, a final question. Is, so those that have written uh, on this battle have often portrayed Overloan as the only tank battle that ever happened on Dutch soil. Right? So when the Germans invaded the Netherlands in, the in 1940, in May, um, they did meet, meet fierce the resistance, but the Dutch, as you probably know, didn't have tanks at all in 1940. So there could not be any tank battles in that invasion. And, and this, this, especially the American part, has been portrayed as a tank battle. Now, I think, um, and that's basically what the authors of the book that you can see on the right basically claim, we can question this uh, to a large extent. And so, so it's only, if you want to call it a tank battle, it's only to uh, some extent true. Right? So you could say the Americans, um, they do use their tanks and they do try to use them in a classic tank battle. But, the, but it's not the case that there is a lot of tank to tank fighting. It's above all infantry and uh, artillery against tanks. And that's also applying to uh, when the Germans use their tanks to, to initiate counter. So, right? so if you want to call it the tank battle, it's, it, it's to some extent true for the American attack. But the British attack is much more cautious. It's much more infantry advancing and then being supported by tanks. It's not geared towards tank battle as such. And Dinan and Swat, two of these um, amateur historians uh, I mentioned earlier, and with all big, uh, all respect that they earn, basically say this is no tank battle at all. It's not a classic tank battle where you have two sides operating large numbers of tanks and clashing head on. That is not what happens here. And as such, I would say it fits into a larger pattern of warfare in the Western theater. Also in Normandy, there are relatively few uh, tank versus tank engagement. Above all, uh, in the defensive role, it is artillery, but it's not like uh, on the Eastern Front or the only real large scale uh, tank versus tank engagement. Artur in September 19th, I think it's Northeastern Front. So it's more a tank versus infantry and artillery. To give you some um, conclusions, well, why has the Battle of Overloan become a forgotten battle? Well, 
I think that has a lot to do with the fact that it's not um, something that stands out when you compare it to, to Arne or the battle for the Schelde or Walchen in, in, in Zeeland. Right? It, is, it is a sluggish battle. There's a lot of mud involved. There, it's more reminiscent of the First World War and therefore it probably has been forgotten in the wider, wider theater of war. Why was it such a difficult uh, campaign? Well, I told you already, it's, it's a uh, difficult terrain the British and the Americans have to deal with. Um, it is the tough German uh, opposition. Um, and it's also the underestimation of the, uh, of the opponent and the bluster uh, preparation. That being said, I don't want to take away anything of the, the efforts uh, that the, the Americans and the British uh, put into the fighting here at Overload. It's probably also the reason why it has been forgotten. Now, this battle should be seen basically in, uh, in a more larger strategic framework. Right? The British were not, and the British and Americans were not necessarily geared towards liberating the Netherlands as such. Liberating the Netherlands was part of the advance towards Germany. That's probably also the reason why the Allies were re ready to take such high casualties. That the British also lose around a sixth of all that cash here um, in the Netherlands. So, but it did give them a vital um, stepping stone or a bridge head towards uh, for the, uh, the final advance into Germany in early 1945. But I think that it has been forgotten has to do with the fact that there was no glorious victories to celebrate Everything was wet, misty, and sickening. So it was not this, well, glamorous, if that's a correct word, battle that we saw at Arnhem uh, or in Normandy. It was more reminiscent of the First World War, and it probably explains why it has been forgotten. Finally, was it a tank battle? Most recent historians would say it's not. It's more a tank versus uh, artillery battle with uh, the infantry playing the major role. And I hope that I can... I, I have made a bit clear to some extent as to why this, this battle has gone into uh, oblivion, so to say, uh, in the larger military historical group. Second, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. For, um, I will very... stop sharing. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fascinating lecture. I, I have to say that um, there's one more battle that's been overshadowed by uh, um, uh, Operation Overlord, uh, the Battle of Normandy, which is uh, Operation, uh, Operation Bagration. And uh, mm. yeah, if you, you probably know uh, more about it. Um, the 22nd of June, 1944, which is the the um, uh, counteroffensive that the Soviets start and that's a big battle. Um, the entire army group center is destructed, uh, destroyed, and um, I think every everything is uh, there's a high profile about Normandy that overshadows everything that's happening, and uh, from that part until the end of the war. So, thank you, but that was fascinating. And um, our next uh, speaker, we'll have time for uh, more questions later. Um, our final uh, speaker for today is uh, my good friend, uh, Danny Olbach, uh, which is an associate professor in the history and Asian studies department at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And after graduating from Tel Aviv University, he studied in Tokyo University and receives his PhD from Harvard University. Olbach has published extensively, extensively on modern history of Japan, Germany, and the Middle East, focusing on military coup d'etat, uh, political assassination, disobedience of officers, military adventures, uh, intelligence and espionage in the Cold War, irregular warfare, and the dynamics of unsanctioned military massacres. Amongst his books, uh, The Plots Against Hitler, published uh, uh, with Houghton Mifflin, and I might add that the first uh, version of uh, uh, Churchill's uh, six uh, pack uh, was published without Adam Lippmann, so that's a, that's a good publishing house. Um, Curse on this country, the rebellious army of Imperial Japan, or Corn Cornell University and fugitive history of the Nazi adventures during the Cold War uh, in Pegasus and Hearst. Olbach is currently, uh, uh, his current research project is Punishment Behind Japanese Military Brutality, 
and it's a long uh, durée history of Japanese war ethics, laws of war, and attitude towards enemy civilians from 1868 to 1945, and it was accepted to publication with Hearst. So today, uh, Professor Olbach will speak about the rubbish heap principle, Nazi identity after 1945. Danny, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Aaron. I'll just share my screen. Uh, just a second. You see my screen, right? Yeah. yeah. In Israel, we often discuss the question of who is a Jew. Today, I want to provocatively discuss the question, who is a Nazi? Or what was Nazi identity constituted of after 1945. And this is based on my larger project that Yaron mentioned, my book, Fugitives, A History of Nazi and Mercenaries During the Cold War. My main takeaway, which I'll try to prove today, is as it follows. The rubbish heap principle, what I call the rubbish heap principle, I would try to argue and convince you but after 1945, there were no Nazis in the pre-war and wartime sense of the term, because it was impossible to be a Nazi in this sense. Circumstances did not allow. And that goes even to the people who defined themselves as neo-Nazis. And yet, many Germans preserve different aspects of Third Reich political culture. And now to the details and the arguments. There are several historical views of a continuity and change after 1945, and I don't uh, try to make a full survey of the historiography, only several key views. Of course, in his famous book, The German Dictatorship, Karl Dietrich Bracher, wrote that Nazism did not begin in 1933 and it did not stop in 1945. And Bracher made a very interesting choice, historiographically speaking, to continue his book on the Third Reich until the mid-50s, elaborating with the neo-Nazi parties that were active after the war, especially the Social Reichspartei, the Social Reichs Party. If you look at the press in the 1950s and the 1960s, the international press, the English-speaking press, the French press, and notably the Israeli press, you'll see a recurrent theme of a fear that a fourth Nazi Reich is in the making. And West Germany is some kind of a host for a resurgent Nazism, and it's only a little while before German revanchism will come back again into the fall. And these prophecies of Fourth Reich were really, really, really common from the Israeli point of view. If you will read the speeches of Menachem Begin, the leader of the Israeli opposition at the time, was very anti-German, you will see this theme coming again and again. This was a prevalent fear. And this fear was based on a very real fact. The West German establishment, and I don't speak about East Germany now, which is a different story. The West German establishment was full of Nazis. Some of them relatively senior people in the Third Reich, many of them war criminals. Uh, that was true in many uh, post-war West German institutions. By the way, the institution where the largest share of former SS and Gestapo criminals were the federal criminal police. But it was true in the intelligence, it was true in the army, the Bundeswehr, it was true in the foreign ministry, uh, it was true even in the Verfassungsschutz, uh, the uh, internal intelligence, and virtually in the judiciary, virtually every West German institution you look at. So onlookers viewed it, this preponderance of Nazis in West Germany, and they concluded that Nazi resurgence is a matter of time because the entire apparatus is filled with Nazis. But, and this is a big but, 
these Nazis who filled the West German political system didn't really lead or try to lead a Nazi policy. They led a democratic pro-Western policy. And a more interesting issue is that, you know, Germany was full with former Nazi supporters and loyalists, millions and millions of them. They could vote in the elections. The ballot was secret in West Germany, just like in any other democracy. At least until 1954, there were new Nazi parties that operated quite legally, like, for example, the Social Reichspartei. And most former Nazis did not vote for these neo-Nazi parties. They voted for democratic parties. And that begs an explanation. It's very intricate tension between continuity and change among the people who are Nazi loyalists and even among the people who define themselves as Nazis after the war. I want to begin it with a very provocative and interesting example, which I discovered in the course of my research. In 1954, the main neo-Nazi party in West Germany, the Social Reichspartei, SPR, was uh, illegalized in West Germany, and the leaders escaped to Cairo. And the leadership met in Cairo in 1954, and fortunately for us, a CIA spy was in the meeting. So we have a report about this meeting of the leadership of this new Nazi party. And the debate in this meeting was about the question, what should the neo-Nazis do, the national Germans, as they call them, if there will be a third world war on German soil? Between the Soviets and the Americans, and of course, a, such a war will probably a break out in Germany. So whom should the neo-Nazis support? And the two leaders of the party had very different opinions about the subject. Uh, Fritz Dors, which you see here on the left, believed that the national Germans should support the United States, the lesser even in such a case. The other leader, Otto Ernst Remer, believed that the national Germans should in fact support the Soviets in such a case. And uh, the debate heated up. And then Reimer, the pro-Soviet leader, yelled at Dorst, the pro-American leader, you are secretly working for the Jews and the Jesuits. You know, everybody who knows the Third Reich knows that that could have been a devastating accusation from a Nazi ideological point of view. And what is really astounding here is the answer that Dors gave to his accusation. He said, yes, I'm working with the Jews and the Jesuits because the last war had proven that international Judaism and the Catholic Church are world powers and the German people cannot alienate them again as Hitler had done. You see something very interesting here, right? A leader of a proclaimed neo-Nazi party boasts working with Jews. That means something in the ideology, even if neo-Nazis, actually changed considerably. And that change is interesting and worthy of uh, research. The constraints on Nazis after 1945 were first and foremost, foremost constituted of the after the defeat of Nazi Germany. Nobody, even the most ideological Nazi, could deny that Hitler was defeated. If Hitler was not defeated, how, how come Germany is ruined? How come the leaders of the Nazi regime stand trial? How come Hitler made a suicide? If it was clear, it was not open to debate. And an ideology that was defeated could not be adopted in its entirety after the defeat. The circumstances are different. You have to pick and choose. Because if the entire Nazi package was correct, then why Germany had come to such an utter defeat? And Nazis were forced to pick and choose an element of Nazi ideology that they wanted to preserve 
and to discard the rest. This is what I call the rubbish heap principle. The first interesting example is Hitler's successor, Admiral Karl de Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz, who said actually during this very short period of the Flensburg government after Hitler made his suicide, uh, when he was Hitler's successor, and I quote uh, in my translation, certain elements with, of national socialism will be surely abolished by our enemies. After ele other elements, we will abolish ourselves. But the most important element in national socialism, which is the people's community, the Volksgemeinschaft, that element we have to preserve at all costs. So this is an example of the rubbish heap principle. Hitler's successor, who could be Nazi more than Karl Dönitz, actually says only a certain element in national socialism, which he saw as the most important element, could and should be preserved, and many other elements should be discarded. Of course, when the Cold War began, Germany was divided, and former Nazis and neo-Nazis in West Germany had to make a difficult choice about what to preserve. One possible choice was what I call the Western choice. And the figure that symbolizing this choice is this man, General Reinhard Gehlen, a Nazi intelligence, German Wehrmacht intelligence analyst, who worked for the Americans after the war and established the BND, the West German Foreign Intelligence Service. And for Gehlen, the most important element that he wanted to preserve from the ideology of the former regime was anti-communism, which for him was epitomized by the struggle against the Soviet Union. And in order to pursue the anti-communist West, Gehlen was ready to adopt Western-style democracy. He was ready to work with the United States, discard Nazi anti-Americanism. And very importantly, he uh, actually fired one of his officers, sacked one of his officers, who was overtly anti-Semitic because Gellin concluded that this will not be palatable for his American partners. So in order to preserve anti-communism, he was ready to discard Nazi aversion to democracy and to the West and even anti-Semitism. And uh, that was one choice, one possible choice that actually most former Nazis in West Germany made. Choosing anti-communism, discarding the rest. For Gehlen, by the way, anti-communism was even more important than Western, than German nationalism. Because he once said that if Germany will be united under the communist banner, he will go to the United States and fight along with the Americans against this united Germany. Other former Nazis made a very different choice. For Otto Ernst Rehme, whom we mentioned, aversion to the West and anti-Semitism were the most important components of the former Nazi ideology. And these components, he believed, should be kept. Anyone who knows the history of the coup, abortive coup of July 20th, 1944, I wrote an entire book about it, knows that Otto Ernst Rehmer was the Wehrmacht officer who actually put down the coup, so was a hero in neo-Nazi circles. And he believed that the West is the real enemy of Germany because the West is aligned with the Jews, and therefore he was ready to serve the Soviets. In case, at least, of a war between the Soviets and the Americans in, on German soil. And actually, many other former Nazis, including SD and SS officers, served the Soviet Union as morals inside West Germany, discarding anti-communism, but embracing the Nazi anti-Western bias, it usually went along with a very strong sense of anti-Semitism. But there were other choices. During the early 1950s, 
There was a very interesting movement of former Wehrmacht officers and evolved, self-evolved Nazis called the Ohne Mich Bewegung, the Without Me Movement. That movement actually opposed the rearmament of Germany because rearmament of West Germany means actually that West Germany will be in the Western camp. And also it precluded an option to unite Germany as a neutral country, which the Soviets proposed at some point or in the 1950s. So they believed they wanted to preserve a version to the West and to the Soviet Union at the same time, but they had to discard German militarism because the price of it was being a demilitarized country. So you give up on German greatness, you give up on German power, you give up on German militarism, but you preserve animosity towards the West and the Soviet Union. And there was another group, which I call the post-colonial Nazis. That was a very distinct ideological group uh, already in the Third Reich. Uh, people who believed that Germany should be allied with the awakening Third World. The Third World is an anachronistic term, of course, but the non-European countries, especially Japan, but also the Arab nations and the Middle, of the Middle East, against international Judaism and the capitalist powers. Here you see the famous meeting of Hitler with the Palestinian Mufti, Haj Amin al kind of epitomized, uh, this idea, and after the war, some of his people, including the Arab expert of the SD, Wilhelm Weissner, and Alois Brunner, Eichmann's assistant, and these are only two notable examples, actually immigrated to the Middle East and helped what they call the Arab liberation movement against the European powers and the Jews, Israel. For these people, a version to the West, and especially anti-Semitism, were the most important components. But they have to give up on the element of racism, because against colored people, because this is not only like in the Third Reich, being allied with Arabs, for example, or with the Japanese, but with a presupposition of German superiority the strategic interests of the German Empire. Here, they actually served Arab regimes as second fiddles, which actually meant subordinating themselves, quote, quote, to non whites And that was extremely controversial among neo-Nazis. And you see it especially with the Algerian war. Because during the Algerian War of Independence, Brunner, Eisner, several other former SS figures served the Algerians against the, the French, also due to the traditional anti-French animosity, certainly strong in Nazi circles. But many other neo-Nazis actually supported France because they supported a white power against a non-white subjugated people. So here, the group which I call the post-colonial Nazis clashed with the group one may call the traditional racist. And this is yet another example of the rubbish heap principle. Of course, there were people for whom anti-Semitism was virtually an obsession, the only thing they wanted to preserve, and the best example is Alois Brunner who went to Syria and a virtually filled decades with completely phantasmagoric plots of terror attacks against Israel. He was obsessed with Israel. And this is an example of a Nazi who wanted to continue the fight against the Jews and nothing else was really important to him. You are all Holocaust scholars and we all know well that Alois Brunner played a very big part in the Holocaust as Eichmann's assistant, he was very proud of it and he just wanted to go on killing Jews. Nothing else mattered uh, for him. To connect it to our discussion before, and you remember the meeting I described in the new Nazi party in 1954, 
after the debate was heated, doors and rumors started to accuse one another of collaboration with the Soviets or the Jews, Alois Brunner entered the room. And then Dorf, the pro-American leader, who admitted he was working with Jews, closed the meeting. He said, with this swine, I'm not ready to speak. He's intolerable for our allies. Because an, even a neo-Nazi leader who wanted to collaborate with the Americans knew that such an anti-Jewish figure, such as Alois Brunner, is kind of out of the question. And he was not ready to even speak with him or to let him participate in the meeting. Of course, there were many people who chose nothing, who were completely cynical, but were devoid of the country. I deal with these people at great length in my book, Fugitives. This is a perfect example. Wilhelm Oetel was active in Austria. And these people were mercenaries who virtually worked for anybody who was ready to pay, the United States, the Soviet Union, usually for everybody at once, as double agents. And they were intelligence peddlers. They had no ideology. They were cynical about everything. And that was also a choice of many former Nazis. After making these choices, a few notes about the powers in the Cold War and how they coordinated with Nazis who navigated this map. The CIA looked for allies in Germany and in Eastern Europe. The Americans, as we all know, in the late 1940s, the early 1950s, knew very little on the Soviet Union. And one of the best ways to gain intelligence on the Soviet Union was to collaborate with people who have just fought the Soviet Union, which means Nazi intelligence personnel. And this uh, two men, Ellen Dallas, the mythological head of the CIA on the right, and James Critchfield, who was his man, CIA man in Germany, believed that it's safe to collaborate with former Nazis because they are surely anti communist So their implicit assumption was that according to the rubbish principle we just defined, Former SS and SD people, even criminals, surely chose the anti-communist component of Nazism, discarding the rest. But of course, they were uh, deluded. They had many blind spots, and for several reasons. First of all, not all former Nazis picked the Western choice, even if it seemed they did. And the intelligence services of West Germany that worked very closely with the CIA were in fact riddled with Soviet moles, most of whom were former Nazis, who actually hated the West more than the Soviet Union. So actually Dallas and Critchfield overemphasized the importance of anti-communism among former Nazis. There were many charlatans and intelligence peddlers who actually changed sides in the Cold War very often and worked with everybody as double and triple agents. The uh, Soviet most proliferated. And the worst thing that problematized the strategy of Western intelligence in West Germany is that the CIA then and now, by the way, is very, very bad in foreign language expertise. And as they didn't know German, they didn't know Russian, they didn't know Eastern European languages, they were too dependent on the former Nazi sources that often really fooled them and sold them warm noodles as a intelligence. I just want to give you a very amusing example that I saw in the documents to see how to show you how much the German was basic. A, they intercepted the letter of Alois Brunner from Syria. Alois Brunner was, was at the time an arms merchant, and he wrote, "When I, I'm looking, I'm waiting for my friend to return from Qatar, from Doha, and then we will speak about the cement factory." That was what was written in the letter. Of course, you all know that in German, "from Doha" will be "von Doha." And then I see a note of the CIA analyst. We don't know a Nazi named von Doha, but we are still looking for this person. Just to show you their lack of expertise and how much we were dependent 
on very dubious sources, especially in the first years of the Cold War. Another problem was that veterans of Nazi intelligence exchanged information with one another. So even former Nazis who were really loyal to the Americans and worked in West German intelligence had very good ties with other Nazi veterans who worked for the Soviet Union. And they often exchanged information. So it was like a, a computer network contaminated by views, information kind of leaked to the Soviet Union very quickly and in huge quantities. And finally, though even for Nazis, again, who picked anti-communism out of the rub ship, there were very different interpretation of what anti-communism means. And one of the most interesting examples took place in 1953 with an organization called the League of Young Germans, a Bund Deutscher Jugend, if I remember well the German term, and that was a stay behind network. Remember, in the early years of the Cold War, virtually not everybody, but many intelligence analysts, policymakers of all levels, believed there is going to be a third world war with the Soviet Union. That was a very prevalent belief. And as the Soviet Union had much stronger conventional forces in Germany, the working assumption was that the Soviet Union will run over West Germany, at least in the beginning of the war. Therefore, the CIA planned to stay behind networks, guerrilla networks that will fight the Soviet forces. One of his groups, the League of Young Germans, that was composed of former Nazis, Again, people who chose anti-communism out of the rubbish ship and were completely ready to work with the United States. The only problem is that they define communists in the Nazi and not in the American way. And therefore, they planned to assassinate social democratic politicians in West Germany. And when it was discovered, it was a huge scandal, very embarrassing for the CIA. Another issue was that often Nazi, Nazi prejudice has leaked in to German intelligence through these former Nazis. One of the myths that former Nazis in Western, a West German intelligence held was the myth of the Red Orchestra. We all know from the Second World War that there was several espionage cells who worked for the Soviet Union which post facto the Gestapo called all of them the Red Orchestra. And there was an assumption that the Red Orchestra was one unified organization that it worked for the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany, but it was not the case. And former Gestapo agents who worked for the Americans and West German intelligence after the war resold these myths to the Americans and virtually tried to convince them that every conceivable leftist, even moderate leftist, and virtually everybody who opposed the Nazis, resistance fighters, are actually part of the third orchestra, Red Orchestra, which is now a Soviet intelligence network. And West German intelligence and its American patrons were so obsessed with this Red Orchestra, but they didn't pay attention to the fact that the real Soviet moles were actually former Nazis. So this myth was actually an intelligence blind spot. Of course, the most famous example is Heinz Pelfe, a former SD officer who wanted to take revenge on the British and the Americans for the bombing of Dresden, his hometown, and was the Soviet Union a small double agents inside West German intelligence. He made a tremendous damage, both to West Germany and to the CIA, incalculable damage, similarly to Kim Philby. And the reason that they took this man and made him a senior officer in West German intelligence was due to the blind spot that Nazis are certainly anti-communist, and if somebody is suspected in pro-Soviet espionage, is probably a leftist. And that was not the case. Some conclusions. Absolute defeat brings about ideological transitions even, um, even among true believers. That was true in Germany. That was true in Japan. Nobody could imagine that Hitler did not fail. 
And if he failed, probably some of the things that he did were wrong, especially making the entire world an enemy of Germany. And that's my boldest start. After 1945, there was no possibility to be a Nazi in the wartime and pre-war meaning of the term. Not because the former Nazis became better people, they did not. But because Cold War conditions just did not allow it. And that's why the fears about the Fourth Reich in the 1950s, 1960s were completely preposterous. Because most former Nazis did not take a Nazi policy. And yet... Even people who stopped defining themselves as Nazis or even never used the definition, like Reinhard Gell, never defined himself as a Nazi, preserved dangerous aspects of third Reich political, political culture, just like the paranoia with the Red Orchestra, for example. The difficulty to know what one picked from the heap of rubbish brought about various intelligence failures, as we discussed. And then I want to kind of finish it with a provocative question. If it was not possible to be a Nazi in the wartime meaning of the term after 1945, is it possible to be a Nazi today? When people in Germany said that parties like the AfD are Nazi parties and new Nazi parties, what do they mean? What elements of Nazi ideology do these people keep or preserve? What elements do they discard? These things should be discussed, and the term Nazi tends to cloud that. And I'll just finish with one important reservation. There was an aspect of Nazism which was preserved by many in West Germany, including in the government and administration, and that is the attempt to help Nazi fugitives and criminals escape trial. So that was an important element of Nazi culture, which was very much present in West Germany, and that's a kind of an exception to my overall thesis. Thank you very much. I just stop sharing the screen. Yaron, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you for a very uh, thought-provoking lecture. And uh, I must say, for me, the uh, most striking uh, part of it was the uh, uh, meeting in Cairo in 1954, uh, where they're speaking about what will happen if there will be provoking another, a Third World War. So um, wishful thinking about their uh, uh, power. And I, I and I would like to uh, ask the first question, uh, if I may, and uh, then we'll open the floor for uh, Q and A's uh, and and the discussion. So for you, uh, Danny, um, and in 1956, there's an amnesty, um, um, asset, actually telling all the uh, ex-Nazi villains uh, they can come back home. Uh, how? Um, one of these uh, that you're talking about, did any of them come back to Germany um, after 1956? Yes, they all did, uh, both Dors and Remer. Uh, Remer actually retired from politics, uh, Dors retired from politics. Remer became an arms merchant, especially in the Middle East and working for all sorts of Arab and third world countries. And uh, others remained in the Middle East because it was actually much more profitable. Mm -hmm. Because in Germany, they could not receive the salaries they believe they should receive because there were no developed military industries in the beginning. And I saw somebody asked about the scientists. And that's just the thing. It was, for example, if you walk in Egypt, Egypt needed talent on the cheap. And the detritus of Nazi Germany was very tempting to many of his third world countries because it was a top rate a first-rate <clears throat> European power that was suddenly destroyed. So, so many people with military talents were just looking for jobs. Uh-huh, okay. And I'll just add uh, Albert Gansenmuller that comes back uh, from Argentina in 1956. So that was, uh, um, the, the uh, rat route was turning around um, by then. 
Okay, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin, Danny. The uh, floor is now open for uh, discussion and for questions. So please, um, Verena, please. Yes, uh, I would have, uh, like to ask uh, Dan, um, what or how do you, I mean, how do you define a pre-war or war, a wartime sense Nazi? Because uh, this is the broader question of what is a Nazi? And to AfD, I will say something later. So in my opinion, uh, this is a, a combination of certain elements. The defined wartime Nazi ideology, of course, I speak simplistically because even in wartime Germany, there were many different emphasis on different things. But I will define them as certain aversion to the West, to the capitalist West, plus very strong anti-communism. So Germany is neither in East nor in the West. A racism, anti-Semitism, all of these things somehow should live together and militarism. You know, I believe that Germany needs a strong army, it needs to be a military power. And what I argue that in the post-war world, it was impossible to keep this entire package together. You had to pick and choose something and discard the other things. That's, by the way, I want to kind of make a certain reservation. When I say discarding anti-Semitism, for example, I don't mean doing it in private. Somebody could be still a fanatical anti-Semitism in his private life and conversations. I speak about discarding anti-Semitism as an organizing principle of the state, as it was in Nazi Germany. So you, there, there is a distinction between uh, the political level and the private level, of course. Definitely. Because in the private, a person could believe anything, right? But these people were political people. And what I'm speaking about is the political choices they made. And you can see it in voting patterns. Most former Nazis did not vote for neo-Nazi parties. Exactly. They, vote, they voted for democratic parties because they picked and chose something. And this something was often anti-communism. But as I, as I showed, not always. If you look, for example, at CDU posters, election posters from the time, you see some caricatures which could have existed in the wartime, like all roads of Marxism are leading to Moscow, a kind of picture of a monstrous dragon, <clears throat> therefore vote CDU. But this is one element of Nazi ideology. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, two more questions, uh, Shoshana and after uh, Itzhak. So Shoshana, please begin. I wanted to ask you, uh, Dan Obach, um, if the f uh, is the fact that the Jewish agency and later the State of Israel worked with uh, former Nazis, uh, at the was one of the reasons why it was so common and uh, legitimate to work with the uh, the, the American uh, felt free to work with ex-Nazis. I don't think that the Americans needed any legitimation from Israel <laughs> at the time. Um, the Americans did it actually before Israel was even established, and Israel was... No, no, Israel... but the Jewish agency immediately worked with the ex-Nazis in the Bricha. The first, that I didn't study, the first example that I know for certain, that I studied, is the cooperation of not the Mossad, uh, the predecessor of the Mossad, uh, Mamad, the Department for Political Research in the what, Israel what Foreign what Ministry. Date? In 1949. 1949. Yeah, worked, yeah, worked with Walter Rauf, who was yeah. actually one of the vilest Holocaust perpetrators, uh, the inventor of the gas bands. Yeah. Uh, who was mad on Syria because the Syrians virtually kicked him out. So he was ready to give uh, intelligence uh, to uh, Israel. 
it's not completely certain that his handlers knew about his involvement in the gas vents, but let's say they were not keen to ask and to explore. Uh, in such things, ignorance is bliss. So they kind of closed their eyes. Uh, in fact, what I, I think I'll try to put kind of a, a, a rule of thumb here. If a practical need is clashing with morality, for example, the need to work with Nazis in the Cold War against the Soviet Union or against the Arabs, if you are Israel, and Holocaust memory, idealistic calculations, usually the practical consideration wins. That was true with the United States, that was true with France, that was true with the UK, that was true with the US, that was true with the Soviet Union. Into when the moral way. consideration comes against into the in, into the fore, when the practical need is no longer there, after the Cold War is over, it is very very easy to repent on American collaboration with Nazis. It is very easy to do it now when you don't need them any longer. And forgive me for being cynical. Okay, thank you, Danny. Uh, please, Itzhak, uh, and after that, Clem. Um, and Dan, I wanted to ask you about Japan and the non-aligned uh, countries, which are the third world. But Japan, we don't know what's happened in the aftermath. We research different things. Many Japanese intelligence officers actually had various anti-Semitic orientation. Okay, but but afterward, where are they in this Cold War? pro-German or pro-West uh, constellation. You never hear about Japanese intelligence officers or military people who would have been, you know, who are on the Nazi side. You never hear about them serving uh, the West or the Soviets afterward. Well, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, the Americans already under McCarthy when they ruled Japan used former Japanese intelligence officers in a very similar way as they used Reinhard Gehlen in Germany. That was almost a parallel image. I believe the person was called Arisugawa, but I'm not completely, the name escaped my mind. Um, that was stopped very quickly. While in West Germany developed into the BND in Japan, it didn't develop beyond infancy for two reasons. Sorry, something uh, out. Uh, it, uh, it did not develop beyond infancy for two reasons. Uh, first of all, these people were rather incompetent, though it did help the U.S. during the Korean War. Uh, but Galen was quite incompetent as well, so that was not the only reason. The main reason was that Yoshida Shigeru, who ruled Japan in the 1950s, or the most important early post-war prime minister of Japan, was mad at the army. He hated the army. The reason was that he was one of the conservative liberal politicians who were harassed and persecuted by the army in the 1930s. He saw the army as the guilty party in the war and the devastation of Japan. And after Japan was established, he didn't want to hear about working with his people for former Japanese intelligence. He did he, preferred of actually not having a serious intelligence service at all. And that was unlike Adenauer, who was actually also suspicious towards Reinhard Gehlen, but the context of West Germany in the Cold War, you must have a strong intelligence service. And Adenauer was less mad at the army because in Germany there was the SS, which you could shift all the blame to. In Japan there was no SS, right? The army was also the SS. So you couldn't excuse the army in Japan as the Wehrmacht was accused in, excused in West Germany, the dominant narrative. Thank you. Uh, Martin, did you want to uh, comment on something? Glenn was first. Uh, Glenn, please. Sorry, Glenn. Uh, it's, it's just actually a quick question about how Europe, Italy, France, Spain, Germany, Swung the exact opposite. They wanted to be different from being right wing. So elections held swung left wing. They essentially, by the 1950s and 60s, became too socialist, too left wing, and potentially a, a threat to the Hoover type 
view of right-wing economics, at least. And this is always why, even in the 1930s, Nazi fascism was more tolerated than Soviet communism, was because of the economic criteria. And in my research on the origins of the European Union, which is per se, one could say, the Fourth Reich by economic means with German dominance economically, to what extent, uh, Dan, did you find that specifically the Americans were very willing to tolerate former Nazis specifically in economic positions because they didn't want socialism and communism to take a hold in their NATO allies, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, to the extent of 1961 even organizing coup d'etats in Italy. So what have you found from your research in terms of uh, that on the economic line? I dealt with the intelligence apparatus more than with the economy in my research, so I can just extrapolate from what I saw from the groups I studied. It was not, as some people believe, that the Americans were enthusiastic about working with former Nazis or they didn't care at all, especially if these people were from the SS or kind of known criminals. Remember, the Wehrmacht was not seen as a criminal organization back then. So all of these studies that we know about the crimes of the Wehrmacht, that was not a narrative, even in the United States during the 1950s. But when they had to, they believe they had to work with such people for all sorts of material interests, in my case, knowing about the Soviet Union, which you didn't know enough about, almost always the material interest overtrumped the ideological considerations. And if you look at it from their point of view, it's actually very much understandable. We know that there was no Third World War with the Soviet Union. They didn't know. And it would be, from their point of view, completely irresponsible not to do something that will help national security in the future because of a past revenge, which is not relevant. And you see it also in the case of Israel. So what can, you know, the security of the state is more important than even from the Holocaust, which was way more important in Israel, of course, than in the United States. About economics. I think it was very convenient to overlook the huge contribution of the economic magnets to the Nazi regime and to slave labor and to things like that. Though there were some trials, and um, I kind of began to be cynical about the whole thing when I saw a list of scholarships for students in Tel Aviv University, not in the United States, and I saw the Ruth von Bolen. <laughs> scholarship for outstanding students in Jewish studies. So, you know, if the Krupp company could be whitewashed and accepted even by Israel, so why not by the United States? Okay, um, Martin, please, and after that, Boaz. Well, Dan, a very short, short question. So can, can you explain a bit more to, to what kind of Nazis you're referring to here? It seems that, that that the figures you talk about are high rank, higher ranking Nazis. Um, and it's to a certain extent, it, it cannot be a surprise that many former Nazis joined the civil service after the Second World War ended. It just needed them uh, to a certain extent. So, so can, can you say something about the lower rank and file? How, how did that work out in this respect? Or is that impossible to say? I didn't study the lower rank and file. Of course, I studied the people who were the subject of my book, but I think we can follow the lower rank and file in the elections when I mentioned voting patterns. And you see that the two parties that most former Nazis voted to were the CDU and the uh, Democratic Party, the FDP. Um, the second is interesting because actually both, both actually represented ideological concessions from a Nazi point of view. The Nazis tended to be anti-Catholic. So voting for a party which was the party of the Catholic Church is, is not a Nazi thing to do. But it is conservative and anti-communist. So again, it preserves what was seen as most important. But the FDP, the people who didn't want to join the Catholic party, that was a very convenient bourgeois option 
And again, that's interesting from a Nazi point of view, because in the Weimar years, the Democratic Party was actually seen as a Jewish party, and it was accused of being a Jewish party by uh, Nazis all the time. Uh, and again, that's another example of the kind of post-war concessions of uh, uh, people who were Nazis before. But again, I wanted also to emphasize how things stay. And I gave several examples of cultural elements from the Nazi regime that remained. I think we all know here Shlomo Perel, this incredible story of his Jewish boy who posed as a German and passed the war in Nazi schools. He said in one of his many post-war testimonies that even today, when he gave the testimony, I think it was the 1990s, when he hears one of the popular Nazi songs that they learned in school, his heart is moved. So some things die hard. Um, okay, I just want to, you mentioned, I want to uh, comment on something. You mentioned uh, um, uh, Krupp, and um, um, I think in the 90s, uh, the uh, uh, they whitewashed uh, the croup um, name with uh, Ignaz Bubis um, foundations. Um, so the the uh, actual foundation was uh, the, when they give scholars here in Israel uh, scholarships. Uh, it was Ignaz Bubis under uh, Krupp and uh, um, uh, BMW and, uh, and Porsche and, and, and etc. Okay, and so this yes, to... right, right. Now I remember. Now I recall it. Yes. Okay. I won the Ignatz so... Bubis one, so yeah. Yeah. Um, and the the money came from from Krupp, but Ignatz Bubis was was the front. So, um, uh, Boaz, please. This is a comment. Uh... Uh, first, I, I would say to Martin, uh, I saw there was a correspondence with Glenn in the chat. So if you can, what really was the impact of the story overload? I mean, wh why is it important at all? I mean, there was a uh, fighting all over the German Western Front and there was a battle over Lund. And this, uh, the fact that it went bad for the Allies and very hard, what does it mean? What is the impact? This is for you. For Danny, this is more of a comment. Uh, when I teach this era to my students, and we see that actually there is a, a West Germany under Adenauer is a, a crafting a narrative by which the Nazis can be a part of society, although this is not said. I mean, he can't fight all the Germans. He wants them to choose democracy. So he's talking about uh, the German people. Most of them were against Nazis. And everyone is like uh, saying, yes, yes. And But we see that under Adenauer, if I'll take the foreign office as an example, there are more Nazis in the foreign office under Adenauer than there were in the Nazi era. People who were registered uh, active Nazis there are more Nazis in Adenauer's foreign office than there were in the Nazi foreign office. And I think this is, a, until their children came of age in the 60s, the whole story in Western Germany is like, okay, we were beaten, so we need to uh, uh, accommodate the fact that it's better to be under the Americans than under the, the Russians, probably. And they... Adenauer is a part of this lie. I mean, everyone is saying we are different, and, and Ben Gurion is saying this is a different Germany, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some and lies are important or mm -hmm. useful for some lies are very important. And yeah, this was a lie that enabled Germany to become a democratic country. I mean, it's. Uh, I, want I think to say Adenauer something, sorry. in the bottom line, if you see Germany today as a democratic country, one of the leading ones in Europe. Uh, this is Adenauer's success, but the lie had to be broken by the students of the 60s. This is how I see it. But the parents, mm -hmm. they all play the game. Yes, we are now no Nazis anymore and the uh, Nazis were bad, but generally that, it doesn't mean there was a change of heart or anything like that. It was a, 
everyone was playing the pragmatic game and it worked. So this is just a comment to you and uh, Martin, uh, you could uh, say, uh, complete this discussion by saying something about the uh, impact or importance of uh, Avalon. Avalon. Two things, uh, to want to, just to answer to both comments. One is that again, the foreign ministry was full of Nazis, but often in the literature it is discussed at length this ambassador in Egypt was a Nazi, uh, and he did this and this and this in the Holocaust. But usually they find it very hard to prove that he led a, a foreign policy which was even resembled Nazi policy in the 1950s because he did not. Uh, the second thing is that I want to show the continuity, and this is to share with you a document I saw. Uh, this is a report of a German emissary in Israel in the 1950s. And he's trying to explain Israeli internal politics to Bonn. And when he's saying that the Sephardi Jews are discriminated or despised in Israel, he called them Ostjuden. Just to show you kind of his continuities of views about Jews in analysis of Israel in the 1950s. Okay, Verena, please. Yes, I don't know if you ever went to court trials from uh, of these high-ranking guys from the Nuremberg trials, from the lower uh, the follow-up Nuremberg trials, or uh, um, in the course of mass shootings, mass killings, and so on. And this is uh, what I wanted to suggest. Uh, um, check the vocabulary because I know the vocabulary until I was a child which uh, vocabulary was used in Germany and not all, not only in my family, which is today, it, it's not used anymore. So I would rather say uh, it's really interesting. No, it's really crucial to define what a Nazi is because this term is not used in Germany apart from, uh, from okay, in popular press and in media, it's always used. Yes, but if you want to be a serious researcher in Germany, you would never ever use the Nazi term because it's from the German lefts. It's from the so-called anti-Germans who say this and this and that everything is Nazi. And the only people who use it is, of course, the press. And this is different. And if you speak about the AfD, you know what's going on at the moment in Germany. Um, you know, the, the chairperson of the AfD is using, not by coincidence, quotes from Nazis, high-ranking Nazis. So in Germany, I would not use the term. I use it in English. But he's using the exact terms and quotes. So I would say, yes, it's okay to use this term for this party. But they, of course, don't have an open anti-Semitic agenda but what they exactly have is an anti-Muslim agenda. And this is why they uh, uh, get all the votes, especially, and this is this, what you did not mention, in the German former East. Yeah. Because That's this right. was a totally different development in the German, uh, in the former GDR. Because what you said about the drawings and the caricature, I don't know the English term now, Yes, was totally different in the East. It was, of course, not allowed to use anti-Soviet propaganda. Yes. But they didn't yeah. have a problem with anti-Jewish uh, stereotypes and so on. And because I know this, because I went to the um, files from the uh, state security last summer, and this is also interesting, the vocabulary, what Why? they use. Sorry? That's why I want to deconstruct the word Nazi. Yeah, Nazi you Nazi have to deconstruct it. It's very over oversimplifying. What does it mean? What elements from former Nazi ideology are kept and what elements are discarded? If you would have told the Nazi during the war that being a Nazi is being anti-Muslim, that no. would be something which is very, very strange to say in the 1940s, right? Uh, but uh, uh, things uh, change. I would like, I, I, I also believe, though I never wrote a study about it, that the word antisemitism needs to be deconstructed in the same way. Because it's a very big black box. Can you put an antisemite like Sophia Koza? 
who helped to save Jews in Poland during the Holocaust, along with Hitler in the same category. So it's a very big black box that contains many different views about Jews, negative views about Jews, which it's sometimes very problematic to bend it together, but better never start it. So it's just an idea. Marty. Uh, thank you, Boaz. Thank you for your question. Yeah, you, you're, of course, absolutely spot on when you say, well, there's fighting going on everywhere. So why bother about a small village in the Netherlands that uh, no one outside of the Netherlands ever heard of? Um, I, I think that, that from a military history point of view, from a military historiographical point of view, um, I think it, it is time to pay attention to these more um, external theaters, so to say, uh, in the Allied warfare and their strategy in it. And, and therefore, I think this might be an important uh, addition to especially the English language literature. That, that's, that would be my main argument here. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, Aaron, we shall... Uh... Okay, so I think we can uh, conclude this uh, fascinating panel. Thank you very much, Danny, and thank you very much, Martin, for uh, two uh, very good lectures. Um, I want to... Uh, say that uh, these have been uh, two fascinating dates. It was a sheer delight to being able to host this conference regardless of the circumstances. And I can tell you that we had uh, countless debates between us, should we go forward, should we wait? But I'm glad we, uh, um, we uh, um, put this together. Um, we had some fascinating panels, as I said, with a lot of new insights today. Um, one particularly, we didn't have the time for a discussion, but uh, I have to say that the, the children panel, uh, Verena and Boaz, that was uh, tough to listen to. Um, and um, as uh, Boaz put it in words, uh, it was a war against children. Uh, and uh, 1.5 million uh, uh, children being slaughtered uh, is a war against children. And um, uh, coming out of this conference, what we see over and over is that uh, one cannot detach the war from the Holocaust or the war from the atrocities. And just as though you cannot speak of uh, uh, Iron Swords War and or the war in Gaza without mentioning October 7th, uh, 2023. Uh, and when you uh, practice comparative history uh, of both these issues, uh, you get much closer and more clear and broader picture that slightly helps us to get closer to the truth as we all, of course, uh, are seeking. Now, uh, I think uh, um, this is Sir Martin, Gilbert, Sir Martin Gilbert's legacy. Uh, he was a pioneer in this field. And um, uh, as we mentioned uh, yesterday, as uh, uh, Lady Esther Gilbert mentioned, and I wanna thank you, uh, uh, Lady Gilbert, for honoring us with uh, your presence. Um, uh, Sir Martin uh, wrote over 80 books, um, but if I have to pick out one, uh, I'll still go for uh, for this one, uh, Auschwitz and the Allies uh, from 1981. Um, of course, there's the uh, uh, Churchill uh, biography, but I think this one is a, a pivotal work um, and uh, it uh, um, sort of uh, uh, put the path to all of us uh, um, looking over these two issues, uh, war and Holocaust. Of course, there was some uh, criticism that uh, um, uh, Sir Martin didn't uh, investigate into the personalities of the people in Washington and London that did not do uh, uh, enough or were not interested in uh, uh, enough information that came. But uh, still, I might should mention as well uh, uh, as one of the pioneers, uh, Yuda Bauer, that was uh, uh, yesterday honoring us uh, with his presence. And I uh, might mention that uh, Professor Bauer next month will turn 98. And he was amazing yesterday and still sharp as a knife. And uh, I wish him a uh, 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 good health and a uh, uh, long life. Um, uh, we can uh, uh, thank all the people who uh, um, supported us. 
and um, uh, joined us. I see, I see uh, uh, military historians, I see Holocaust researchers, I see even uh, Jacob Borat here from uh, Yad Vashem Archive uh, joining us today and yesterday. Um, this was a sheer delight, as I said, um, and uh, hopefully next time we can meet face to face uh, in better times and uh, uh, um, and more certain. We uh, decided to embrace uncertainty, but I can't say anything certain for the near future. So, uh, Boaz, I'll give you the last words and uh, thank you all. Well, you did it quite well. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, if I try to put everything together, we talked about politics, intelligence, bombing. We talked uh, mostly after Glenn's discussion, it was a big uh, discussion in the chat. Uh, uh, we talked about genocide, war against children, which certainly is a, is a, is a issue that can be developed more. We talked about advocacy, people, uh, the place of the Jews in trying to uh, navigate the system. We had Holocaust, we had war, we had Cold War. Obviously, you can't. If you talk Nazis, you can't uh, 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 separate the World War II and the Cold War. And I feel that I will go back again to what Jerome said and what we said in the beginning. This is a conference about war and Holocaust at the time when we are at war. The us Israelis, at least, uh, we are at war. Uh, this is something you feel. Uh, in many aspects of life. Uh, since it has become a, a customary in the Oscars to say whatever you want on the situation, I will say that we are praying uh, for the return of the hostages as soon as possible. And we are praying that uh, Israelis uh, will suffer no more loss, and consequently, neither would the Palestinians. Uh, this is something we are uh, living on a day-to-day -day basis, opening the, 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 the news in the morning, seeing that another soldier was killed. We see his family, his face, his children. These are, uh, this is not a mercenary army. These are our uh, people, uh, many times relatives, uh, etc. So uh, we really hope for a quick resolution of this uh, battle, return of the hostages, and uh, consequently, a uh, peace to all. So thank you very much. And we are planning, uh, uh, there is talk of a uh, a, Bar a Barbarossa, a later stage a Russian campaign, Eastern Europe conference hour in July. Just, uh, uh, you didn't say anything, so I'll just hint to it. But this is uh, the ne in the context of Holocaust and war, this is the uh, next uh, stepping stone. We are talking about something in July about a uh, a war in the eastern in uh, the USSR. So thank you all. <clears throat> thank you to the organizers, Yaron, Daniela, and uh, whoever else. Uh, thank you for the chairs, and see you all soon in a uh, happier and better times. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Daniela, for being the backbone behind this event. And thank you, Verena, for helping us. And Boaz, uh, we did all this while you were at uh, at uh, duty with the reserves for 151 days. So we want to salute you. And thank you for your work. Um, we're happy you're back. So thank you thank all. Thank you. We have to be in a hurry with the next event, so I will not be back there again. <laughs> OK. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you.